Hello, hello everyone. Uh, good evening everyone and welcome to the second pre-event of the Ocean Challenge uh, for Africa Hackathon. Uh, so today we're going to talk about discovering the data. So today is all about the data. As you know, the Ocean Challenge for Africa Hackathon is brought to life to create a transformative and impact-driven ocean science solution which will help to achieve a more sustainable ocean and improve the daily lives of African people. Uh, if you are joining us for the first time, then this is the second pre-event we organized. The previous one was all about launching the event, uh, letting everyone know that they could start applying. And today we're going to be talking about the data. Before we get there, a few words about uh, who is behind all of this, who are the organizers of this event. So this event is organized by Mercator Ocean International, the IOC Africa and Garage 48. And it is supported by the EU's Copernicus Marine Service and the Seagull Family Foundation. Um, it is further held in partnership with the United Nations Environment Program GEMS Ocean, uh, Geo Blue Planet and the African Group on Earth Observations. Uh, for data partners, which is all we're going to talk about today, we have EUMETSAT, the European Organization for the Exploration of Meteorological Satellites, and EMODNET, the European uh, Marine Observation and Data Network. Uh, so that's where the focus of today is going to be. And we're also very proud to announce uh, today the community partners who are going to help us spread the word about this event. So we have uh, SING, Lake Hub, Tech Tribe, SA Innovation Summit, which we'll talk about a little bit more in detail, and HAPA Space as community partners uh, to help us spread the word and bring more participants to this event. So the main event, the main hackathon, is going to take place online uh, from the 8th to 10th of April uh, 2022. So you can join us from anywhere uh, that you are. And we have four main topic areas. So the first one is a healthy and resilient ocean, uh, marine spatial planning, marine protected areas, biodiversity conservation. Then the second topic area is a productive ocean, marine resources, fisheries, aquaculture. Then the third topic is a safe ocean, maritime safety and weather forecasting. And finally, we have an inspiring and engaging ocean, ocean literacy, awareness raising, etc. So these four areas should help guide uh, the participants on where they should focus their attention during the hackathon, which problems within these four areas they want to pick for that event. And to get you enticed to participate in this event, then we're happy to announce that uh, the cash prize pool has now increased. So now we have about 10,000 euros, uh, which include 5,000 the, from the Copernicus Marine Service and 5,000 euros from the Seagull Family Foundation. We also have a one-year access to the EU's Copernicus uh, DIAS reference service for environmental data, Wikio, for all the winners. And each access has a value of around 1,040 euros. We have the opportunity to present the winning project as a data user testimony during one of the Copernicus Marine Service events. And the prizes are so big now that we have to have two slides for it. So we have the best project that will be added uh, to the use cases section of the website for visibility and recognition. We have virtual tickets for the largest startup event in Africa, part of this SA Innovation Summit for a whole team plus one physical ticket. And we have Ocean Challenge for Africa goodies for all the participants. And as we previously mentioned, the prize pool is constantly growing, so stay tuned for updates uh, on the social media and on the next uh, pre-events that we will have. Who are we looking for to join us uh, on this event? Uh, we are welcoming participants that are either living in or are from Africa. The focus is on improving the lives of Africans with a special focus on coastal areas. So we're inviting business visionaries, marketing wizards, project managers, educators, any sort of web app or service developers, UX, UI designers, uh, marine and coastal field experts, uh, students, environmentalists, data scientists, meteorologists, oceanographers, marine biologists, you name it. Basically, we want to call all interested individuals who care for the ocean and want to contribute with their knowledge and skills. 
Trust me when I say this, a hackathon is a super uh, interesting way to use your skill set in a diverse and different way than you're used to, and it's an opportunity to develop some of the skills that you've been wanting to explore. So it doesn't matter if you're just beginning, it doesn't matter if you don't have uh, the right skills, you come together, you meet people who have some of those skills, and you build something together. So above all, you should have an interest in this topic, and you want to contribute with your knowledge and your time to make, uh, to make the world a better place, to improve the lives of people, uh, especially those around coastal areas in Africa. So don't be afraid to, to participate. The registration was open already from, from a bit uh, before, since the last event. So check out the event uh, webpage on the Garage 48 website and definitely start to uh, register. So today, uh, today is all about discovering the data and we have uh, access to a vast, a vast amount of data and products to create any ocean science solution that you can think of. And why is this so important? This is so important because, you know, you're at home thinking of what topic area to cover, which solution to come forth uh, with, you know, a specific problem that you want to solve. So you're thinking of what problem is interesting to solve. And we're making available uh, a wealth of data that you should use during the hackathon. So take into account that all the participating teams need to use at least one Copernicus Marine Service data product. You're free to combine it with all the other data products we're going to bring, but you should use at least one of the Copernicus Marine Service data products. And that's what we're going to talk about today to get you acquainted with the data. If you have any questions for the speakers, prepare those questions. Uh, you can ask the questions uh, today. You can ask them later after the event. We will have uh, the mentors available for you as well. But start exploring the data because it is very important that you get acquainted with what you can use during the event. So today, what's uh, today about? We're going to talk uh, again with uh, Corinne Derval, who we already um, talked with last time from the Copernicus Marine Service. Um, she's going to talk a little bit more about, uh, about the data that we can use. Then we're going to also meet two other data providers. We're going to meet Elmetsat and Amodnet. So from Elmetsat, we have Haley Evers King, who is a marine applications expert at Elmetsat. And from Amodnet, we will have Francis Strobe, who is a data and communications officer at Amodnet. And after their presentations, we will have a short roundtable. Uh, feel free, if you're watching us on Facebook, to ask some questions again. And just to get a sense of where people are coming from, uh, make sure you comment on the Facebook. Tell us where you're coming from. Uh, post the emoji of the flag of the country where you're watching us from, or just comment where in the world, where in Africa are you uh, following this uh, uh, event today. Uh, but to get the ground started, let's give the floor now to uh, Corinne Derval, who is joining us from uh, Zoom. Corinne, are you there? Hi everyone. Hello. So the floor is yours. Please uh, give us uh, give us your uh, your topic. Okay, I not share my screen. Thank you very much. Hi everyone. Um, thank you for the organization. I'm very happy to attend this event today. So during the kickoff uh, event, I gave an overview of the Copernicus Marine Service on uh, its uh, catalog of products. So today I'm going to present you in more details the products on data available for, uh, for the challenges. Uh, one important uh, thing is that uh, there is one single access point, the web portal, and the service is open and free with a simple registration. You can access the full catalog of products. Um, so there are today um, 200 products distributed in the catalog. You can access the catalog through the Ocean product uh, here and also through the visualization tool. Here, there are two different ways of access, but uh, with the both, it is possible to select, to view, and to download data. 
a few words about uh, the ocean monitoring indicators that are also viable in the catalog here. There are about 100 uh, ocean indicators. They are key variables used to monitor the oceanic trends in line with uh, climate change. And I, I will tell you more about uh, at the end of the presentation and also a few words uh, about uh, the ocean state uh, report here. So 200 Russian catalog, uh, products, sorry, indicators, and the format is the NetCDF uh, format for all the data uh, that can be downloaded. So uh, data comes from three different sources. It covers different regions on uh, different temporal and geographical scales with a different update frequency. The Copernicus Marine Service provides satellite in situ on model data over all uh, European seas and over the global ocean. You can see uh, here all the Copernicus Marine domains covered by the service. Uh, the model data uh, come uh, from uh, 3D uh, numerical representations of the ocean and provide information from the surface to the bottom. Uh, with these uh, numerical models, uh, we provide 10 days uh, of forecast every day. The satellite data are surface products along track on the gridded products. It's only L3 and L4 processing levels data in the Copernicus Marine Catalog. So the L3 products are gridded data, mono or merged sensors uh, with uh, gaps after validation process, and the L4 products are gap-free gridded data after validation process. And the in-situ observation data come from different international networks and from, uh, uh, from XBT, Boys, Marigraph, and gliders, and so on. There are discrete data and uh, more than uh, 3,000 uh, sensors over the global ocean from uh, the surface to 2,000 meters uh, depth for the Argo data, for example. And for all uh, data, there are a long time series uh, of about uh, around uh, 30 years, real-time products with daily and uh, hourly uh, means uh, uh, for some of them on the forecast from the operational numerical models. To illustrate uh, uh, what we have in the catalog on uh, the connection between uh, this uh, data, uh, satellite data, so an uh, in-situ data, uh, and data from uh, analysis and forecast systems that uh, comes from the, the 3D uh, numerical models. Um, these model uh, data are very close uh, to the reality by using uh, data assimilation methods to assimilate all the satellite and uh, in-situ data available. And uh, spatial resolution is from uh, two kilometers to 25 kilometers. And the catalog uh, containing uh, all uh, this uh, data uh, is regularly updated several times a year um, with addition uh, of uh, new products, new parameters, uh, improvement of uh, existing products, uh, and extension of, uh, of the of lo long time series. And to describe uh, this data, we classify them into uh, three groups. The blue ocean, contains the products providing parameters describing the physical ocean. The white ocean contains parameters describing the sea ice and green ocean with the biogeochemistry parameters. So first, um, the blue ocean uh, with the physical parameters. Um, there are five uh, groups uh, as the following. The temperature and salinity, uh, including the mixed layer depths. Uh, the currents uh, parameters, for example, um, the satellite uh, geostrophic velocity or uh, total velocity that can include uh, waves on uh, tidal uh, contribution uh, for the model. The sea surface side parameters, uh, wave variables, which uh, are listed below, see uh, significant wave height, uh, period and direction, for example, and the sea surface wind. And uh, depending on the uh, area, uh, this data uh, has a special resolution from uh, two uh, to 25 kilometers, and uh, they are uh, available from the surface to the bottom for uh, model data. And uh, from uh, the satellite uh, data, uh, also uh, from two to 25 kilometers of, of spatial resolution. 
and uh, for the in situ, there are discrete resolution. So these data uh, are available in a monthly, daily mean, uh, and uh, hourly mean for some of them. And the uh, numerical model provides 10 days of forecast every day. And uh, these data are updated every day, and they are uh, also a long time series. As I said, uh, in the past uh, of uh, 30 years uh, uh, for all of them. Uh, here, some examples for the blue ocean. Uh, here, a map of uh, global currents. This is the forecast for today. Uh, the global model uh, has a special resolution, resolution of uh, one twelfth of degree, uh, so uh, nine kilometers. And here, I uh, zoom on the Agulhas. This is a little animation. A zoom over the, uh, the Aguilas Quran. So we can uh, see that uh, the structures of uh, the, the eddies are well uh, represented uh, here. And here, another uh, example of the sea surface temperature from the operational regional system over the Mediterranean Sea with a special resolution on 124 uh, degree, uh, that is to say uh, four kilometers. And we uh, recognize also uh, the, the, the mesoscale, uh, the mesoscale structures. And uh, finally, uh, another example uh, of surface current um, from the, the EB, uh, EB uh, model, uh, EB for Irish Biscay Island uh, area. So it's uh, from the EP forecasting model with a special resolution of 136 degree, uh, so three kilometers with uh, an output frequency of uh, 15 minutes here, uh, which allows uh, to represent um, high frequency phenomena such as uh, the tide that uh, we can see uh, on, uh, on this example. And this is an animation of the last uh, five days. Now, um, sea ice data describing the white ocean uh, are available on the Arctic Ocean, the, over the Baltic Sea, and over the global ocean, including uh, Antarctic uh, Ocean. Sea uh, ice parameters are sea uh, ice concentration, sickness, sickness, sea uh, ice drift, uh, snow, sea uh, ice edge, uh, presence of iceberg, sea uh, ice edge, and ice surface temperature. So here is it is an animation of uh, the annual average sea ice concentration over the last uh, twenty years. So it's, uh, it, it comes from uh, the, the long time series in the past calculated uh, from the global system at uh, one twelfth of, of uh, degree. So the, this data have the same characteristics uh, as uh, the physical, uh, the physics, physical data, depending on the area on, uh, on, uh, and on uh, the type of uh, data. And we do not have uh, in situ data over the polar area in the Copernicus uh, uh, marine catalog. Now, um, the biogeochemical uh, parameters describe uh, the green ocean. Uh, families are the primary production with uh, the chlorophyll A, the phytoplankton class, phytoplankton size, the low and mid trophic uh, level uh, with uh, zooplankton on uh, micronecton parameters, uh, the oxygen, the optical products including uh, transparency, turbidity, reflectance, uh, sticky depth, and uh, so on. And uh, the carbonate system uh, with uh, the pH, the alkalinity, uh, and the surface pressure of uh, CO2, the, and uh, other, other uh, parameters, fugacity of CO2 also, and uh, nutrients. Uh, with uh, nitrate, phosphate, silicate, iron, and ammonium. Here again, some examples with a global map of uh, surface partial pressure of uh, carbon dioxide in seawater from the long time series reprocessing uh, observation data, so uh, at one degree of spatial resolution. And uh, here, uh, it is 
This is an, uh, an animation from the regional operational model uh, at 136 degrees, EB, the EB model, of the mass concentration of chlorophyll uh, in seawater over uh, January till, um, till next, uh, next Wednesday. So, a few words now about the ocean monitoring uh, indicators, uh, the OMI provided by Copernicus Marine Service. They are free downloadable uh, data covering the past 30 years of the key variables used to monitor the oceanic trends in line with uh, climate change. These OMI are calculated from the Copernicus Marine products. They are classified by family. Currently, uh, there are uh, 10 families of indicators listed uh, here. And uh, there are uh, time series uh, anomalies and trends. So you can access them through the catalog of uh, indicators. And here, uh, this is an example of the global chlorophyll trends uh, from 1997 to uh, 2020. And the positive trends are pronounced uh, in the high latitudes uh, of both northern and southern uh, hemisphere. The figure caption. So, so um, as a conclusion, the access to products uh, through the online catalog is by a single access point, open and free. And for each uh, uh, data products, a uh, product user manual on uh, quality information uh, documents are online available. These documents uh, provide information on data access, format, description of data set content, on uh, quality information with uh, forecast skills, uh, model observation comparison, uh, processing, and um, instrumental error. And you can find also on the web portal, the Ocean State Report. Uh, this is an annual scientific report that provides key reference information on the state of the global ocean on uh, European regional seas, based on the Copet Copernicus uh, marine products and indicators. Uh, this is a synthesis of uh, the ocean state. Um, it um, it draws on uh, expert uh, analysis and is uh, written over uh, 100 scientific experts from more than 30 European institutions. The report uh, aims at uh, increasing uh, general public awareness about the status of the marine environment and uh, changes in the marine environment. And uh, the Copernicus uh, Marine Ocean State Report provides a four-dimensional view, so latitude, longitude, depth, and time of the blue, white, and green ocean using satellite data, models, long time series, and in-situ measurement. And the uh, fifth Ocean State Report uh, has been uh, published. So thank you very much for your attention. So if you have questions, maybe I can answer, or later, I think, during the round table. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, uh, Corinne. I think it was a very, very uh, interesting overview of uh, all the possibilities of the data uh, that you guys are, are making available. And I was just curious uh, at the end with your, um, with the report that you mentioned, the, uh, the uh, ocean report, the fifth issue, perhaps that's also a good starting point for some of the participants to look for challenges and look for ideas of what are the main problems that they might want to solve. Because uh, I understand the, the report is quite comprehensive uh, and they can use that as inspiration, right? Yes, completely right. Uh, uh, and uh, we have also a summary of these reports that is uh, very interesting to, to be uh, read, I think, for the challenges. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I recommend all the participants to take a look at the reports and perhaps they will find a, a worthwhile uh, challenge to, uh, to solve. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't see any questions at the moment, but perhaps we'll have a few questions during the, uh, the round table. So I suggest we, we move on to our second speaker uh, from Elmet Sat, uh, Haley Evers King, who's also joining us on Zoom. She's a marine applications expert at Elmet Sat, and she's going to talk to us a little bit about uh, Emot A. <laughs> Iomet Sat's uh, data uh, that is making made available for this challenge. Uh, Haley, can you hear us? 
I can. Can you hear me? Absolutely. So the floor is yours. Uh, take it away. Perfect. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody, and thanks very much for having me here today. I'm really excited to talk to you and to take part in the rest of this uh, hackathon about um, ocean data and how we can use it to improve lives across Africa. So today I'm going to talk to you just a little bit about the vast wealth of data that we provide from uh, UMETSAP. So first, I just wanted to introduce myself, really. Um, so I'm Hayley Edward King. Um, I have a background in environmental sciences and oceanography. Um, and I actually have a very personal connection uh, to the continent of Africa. I lived and studied in South Africa for oh, five or six years um, during my PhD, working on using remote sensing to look at harmful algal blooms and aquaculture. And I've maintained various collaborations uh, with colleagues across the continent ever since. So I'm very much looking forward to seeing all the applications you come up with. Um, after my PhD, I spent several years working as a research scientist, developing applications for a wide range of different um, ocean satellite data products. And that led me to where I am today, uh, which is working at UMETSAT, where we operate a number of satellites that provide ocean data. And my role is to work with the different users of this data to help them make the most of it, understand how it works technically, and answer any questions they have. And that's what I do day to day, as well as a whole bunch of other fun activities involving cameras and webinars and all sorts of things. It's a really great, diverse job. So I work for UMETSA. As Yao said, this is the European Organization for the Exploitation of Meteorological Satellites. Um, we're an international member state organization. 30 different countries are our members. Uh, we provide observations and data services, mostly for operational weather monitoring and forecasting, but also for climate services. And in more recent years, we've established a lot of additional capabilities, particularly in partnership with the European Union, um, achieving synergy with what we do, uh, with what they would like to do under their own Earth observation programs. And this is where a lot of our ocean related uh, data is now coming from through the Copernicus program. We also have very strong collaborations with African meteorological agencies um, and environmental service providers through initiatives like GMES and Africa. Uh, this uh, image here that you can see on your screens um, just summarizes the large number now of missions that we have operated, are operating now, and will be operating in the future at UMETSAT. Um, we have our main uh, mandatory programs, which you'll see here, the uh, Meteosat program and the Polar System program. Um, these are mostly focused around uh, weather forecasting, but that also involves elements of marine forecasting, particularly providing sea surface temperature data. And we're also looking increasingly to see if we can provide some information on ocean colour, which I'll talk more about in a minute, from some of our imagery services on these missions, especially the next generation coming up. Um, we have optional programs that we've run, um, which have mostly been the JSON series of satellites and the follow on mission, which actually then crosses over into the Copernicus program of uh, Sentinel-6. These are altimetry missions, so missions that are looking at the sea surface height, and these are used in marine forecasting as well as climate studies. Uh, then moving on to what we do under Copernicus, as I said, Sentinel-6 is actually a gap as it bridges the gap between these uh, missions and the um, our own missions at UMETSAT. So we run Sentinel-6 as part of our Copernicus uh, program commitments, um, but we also crucially run the Sentinel-3 mission, which includes the current A and B satellites. And this is really uh, the kind of workforce ocean satellite of the Copernicus program, if you like. And uh, on board, it has three different sets of instrumentation measuring the ocean color, sea surface temperature and altimetry. So this is a really powerful mission for gaining uh, data about the oceans. And that's the main mission that I work on, to be honest. Um, so looking a bit more in detail at those um, three main methods, if you like, of ocean remote sensing, altimetry, which I'll also include synthetic aperture radar on there, similar um, techniques used, um, sea surface temperature and ocean color. Um, you can see in this diagram here that bringing these data sets together, you can really look at many, many different ocean relevant topics. Everything from ocean currents and how they influence maritime safety, uh, storm dynamics, um, other aspects of physical oceanography that are relevant for climate, um, transport of pollutants, ice detection, oil pollution, um, tracking of debris, uh, looking at harmful algal blooms and links between different ocean ecosystems, 
um, fishing zones, aquaculture productivity, coral bleaching, impacts on human health. Um, really, these um, different data sets open up a vast wealth of information about these important um, ocean uh, challenges, opportunities and features that we need to know about if we're going to exploit and protect the ocean for the benefit of ourselves and the planet. And this just goes a bit more in detail into some of these. I've just pulled out a few examples of where our data is being used in different applications. Uh, here I've entitled the slides sea level shipping and storms and the physical data that we get from sea surface temperature and from altimetry can inform um, our observation and understanding of different facets of the physical ocean system. So you can see here uh, the sea level uh, rise record um, over the last, oh gosh, it's 30, nearly 40 years, it's going back now. Um, and you can see how that's risen over time. This is the global record, but you can also look at that regionally using this type of data. Um, using similar methods, we can look at storms, the surges that are affected with them, the winds and the waves, and all of this information can help us to understand potential impacts on coastal um, settlements, on shipping and other human activities in the coastal region. From um, ocean colour data, so this is literally like it says on the tin, the colour of the ocean, as you can kind of perceive with your own eyes, we can draw out information about sediments. And um, you can see an example here on the left hand side of a before and after of a major storm that hit uh, Japan. And you can see a huge change in the sediment dynamics of the coastal region. This reflects the flooding that was happening on land. And this is very important for understanding how we manage port activities, um, the um, impacts on ecosystems in this area that we might be exploiting for aquaculture, um, for all kinds of different activities. I mean, if you're a scuba diver, for example, you definitely don't want to be diving in super turbid water. And this actually brings me on to another um, example application that somebody I know worked on, uh, which you can see on the right hand side there, which was using this information to look at how um, the sediment affects the light underwater and how this then meant that they could adapt their underwater photography techniques to enable them to properly draw out the colours of these beautiful ocean e uh, ecosystems such as coral reefs. Seafood is another major area that's affected by um, different ocean challenges and of course remote sensing and satellite data have something to say here um, and this slide just summarises a number of different applications that have been developed by people around the world to support particularly the aquaculture and fishing industries. Um, whether we're looking at what might be the most productive area to put a new aquaculture facility, um, to provide early warnings of potential harmful um, algal blooms, which can cause problems both for the organisms themselves, but also for our ability to consume them or sell them from our businesses. Um, we've also provided um, information through satellites that can be useful to um, insurance companies to help businesses to plan their operations and to provide some insurance should they get um, impacted by events such as these uh, harmful algal blooms. Safe seas is another really strong issue as well as the physical um, safety at sea there's also the biological factors I just mentioned about the impacts of aqua on aquaculture um, you know if you've eaten some seafood sometimes and got sick that can be a result of poor water quality in different coastal areas um, this doesn't just come from uh, direct links through the aquaculture itself but also from swimming in the water um, satellite data can provide um, good measures of um, quality of coastal waters which is very important for various different policy objectives in different countries you can see some examples on the top left there that have been used towards um, the European framework directors for water quality um, and things in the water can actually affect people swimming in them as well, uh, either just by being unpleasant, which is not great for tourism, or by actually impacting health. And you can see a couple of examples along the bottom there um, where we have cyanobacterial blooms, which can affect human health, um, outbreaks of cholera that were linked to um, these herring eggs and their collection and consumption in areas in Canada. And on the right hand side there, you can see massive um, uh, rafts of sargassum seaweed that landed on different beaches. I think this one was actually in um, Central America and a proper popular tourist destination. And um, so knowing that these things are coming can be quite important for tourist facilities to manage uh, the impacts that it's going to have on their businesses. So as I said before, UMETS operates and delivers ocean data from Sentinel-3 and 6 satellites, as well as from our mandatory and optional programs. Um, focusing on, on the Sentinel data, we provide data at level one and level two. Um, Corinne mentioned that the um, Marine Service is mostly producing data at level three and level four. Um, so level one data really is going 
very close to the data as it comes from the satellite and can really allow you to get hands on and customize the processing of this data. If you're working in a particularly challenging region, um, this can be quite important. Uh, we also distribute level two data, which is typically the fastest available data, um, also usually the highest resolution. Um, it's usually the single sensor, though, so you have these trade offs at these different levels as to what the products can help you uh, to do. Uh, so selecting the right product for the right purpose is quite important. I'm sure we'll be able to help you with that during the hackathon. Um, our level two data from uh, Sentinel-3, for example, includes ocean color measurements. So this is the actual color, the reflectance of the water, as well as derived products such as chlorophyll concentrations, suspended matter concentrations, um, estimates of transparency and some products telling you about the light coming in to the ocean surface. As well as ocean color, we have altimetry. And from this, you can get sea surface height, significant wave height and wind speed information. And we also provide sea surface temperature. Um, as I said, the data can be available very quickly at these levels. So our NRT data is available as soon as three hours after it's sensed, which might be particularly useful for certain applications if you need to be able to make decisions really quickly based on um, something that's happened. Uh, we also provide data at longer latencies, which is typically where we see an improvement in the quality. So we bring in extra data to improve the processing and the certainty with which we can say our measurements are accurate. Uh, we offer a wide range of data discovery and delivery mechanisms, and you can see them all listed here. Um, we offer a service that um, is known as a push dissemination service. So this is where we send the data out from our building up to another satellite and it goes down to dishes directly. Um, there's various uses of this UMET car system across the African continent. Uh, we offer data through our online Copernicus data access service known as CODA, as well as through our data center long term archive. Um, we have a view service, uh, which includes WMS layers that you can access in an interactive way. So I invite you to have a look at some of the data there. And we also offer some FTP services for certain uh, parts of our data portfolio. Um, importantly, our Sentinel-3 data is also available via the Copernicus DS service, which I believe you're going to find more about at a later event. Um, so a lot of the data I've mentioned today is also available alongside the rest of the Copernicus data through that service. Uh, we're currently transitioning to some new data access services. Mostly this at the moment is servicing our um, mandatory program data, but we're trying to bring more and more Copernicus data um, and our satellite applications for these data online over the coming year. So you actually you might start seeing the Sentinel data available on there in the coming months. So if you're really interested in kind of uh, the latest sort of API technology for accessing data, I'd invite you to have a look um, at what we're what we're offering through these new data services, which include both a, a data store as well as a data tailoring service, which allows you to work with the data before you download it and transform it to different um, formats, for example, that suit your purposes. As I mentioned before, as well as um, our our own data services, we also work very closely with Wekio to deliver our data through there for the Copernicus satellites. We have a huge range of resources that you can look at to learn more about our data. You can visit our website. Um, we have two Twitter accounts as well that you are welcome to follow. Uh, we typically share information about our data products and about events that we're involved in there, as well as user stories. Um, you can always contact our help desk, ops at umetsat.inc. If you're asking questions about Sentinel-3 data, it's probably me you'll speak to. Um, we are currently developing a knowledge base for our user support. Um, so if you would like to visit this and give us some feedback, I'd very much appreciate that. This provides a lot of the technical information behind the data and how it's processed. Uh, we're working to constantly provide new code based tools. So if you're into programming in Python, I invite you to visit some of uh, these websites here to have a look at the code we're providing to help you work with the data. Um, we've had various different training events in the past, and a lot of the material is available online at our training website. Um, similarly, we've run several massive open online courses in the past. So if you're looking for inspiration about how our data works and to get a good overall picture about how the Copernicus data fits in uh, with ocean observation, um, have a look there. There's lots of nice videos. They're quite short and bite sized, so you can look at lots of different topics. Um, similarly, we have YouTube videos as well as science stories. Uh, and podcasts and case studies on our website, which can give you more inspiration for how our data can be used uh, in the wide variety of challenges that affect our oceans today. And that's everything from me today. So thank you very much. Uh, good luck with the event. And I really look forward to working with you more in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, uh, Haley. I think it was very, very informative. Uh, again, 
a wealth of data that's made, being made available for the participants at this hackathon. Uh, maybe just a quick question. Um, so did I understand correctly that uh, the data that you're making available or the data that you have access to, is there any forecasting as well? Or you don't provide the, the forecasting uh, through MITSAT? We don't provide the forecasting ourselves, no. So our data feeds into forecasts. So if you um, look at the um, forecast data that's available through the Marine Service, for example, yeah. you'll find that a lot of the models there are assimilating our data. Uh, similarly, our colleagues at ECMWF, um, who operate some of the other Copernicus services, such as the Climate Change Service, you'll see our data assimilated in there. Now, we just provide the data. We don't do the forecasting. All right. So you give you give everyone uh, the raw data, and then they can uh, they can play around with it. That makes sense. Yep. All right. So let's uh, let's see if there's any more questions for you during the panel discussion. And in the meantime, let's move on with our final speaker, uh, Francis Strobe, who's a data and communications officer at Emodnet, and who's going to talk to us uh, about Emodnet data. Francis, are you are you online? One second, I couldn't, I'm not hearing you, so I just don't know if you are muted or... I'm all good, muted, all good. So, yeah. yeah. I'm just looking at my share to give the screen. Um, so yeah, Francis, whenever you're ready, the floor is yours to tell us about the Emodnet uh, data and what the participants can... Uh, can use uh, during this event. Yes, thank you. And uh, thank you for the invitation. It's also for me an honor to uh, present to you today EMOTNET and uh, to give an introduction to Europe's in situ open data service by, uh, by EMOTNET. So, uh, a little bit uh, on me, perhaps. So, uh, I'm an aquatic biologist by training and um, a very nice uh, extra thing that I can tell about myself is that I uh, spent uh, a year in uh, Cape Town as a postdoc at the University of Cape Town together with uh, Sandy, the South African National Biodiversity Institute, where I had a focus on uh, developing uh, data pipelines. So it's a bit in line, I guess, with what uh, you as, a, as attendees here now uh, are looking for in, in developing uh, yeah, pipelines or, or several uh, challenges that you are, uh, yeah, you are uh, will be doing. So um, I'm going to give a brief overview of EMOTNET, but first maybe to uh, give a bit of context. So rapid access to marine data is vital for on one hand, addressing threats to marine environment, understanding trends and forecasting future changes, developing policies to protect vulnerable coastal and ocean areas, and also uh, supporting blue growth. Um, so about EMOTNET. So what is EMOTNET? It's actually a long-term European marine knowledge initiative. It's funded by the uh, European Commission. It's a marine knowledge broker, so providing open and free access to marine data, products and services. It's a large network of over 150 organizations, uh, experts and wider community of data providers and users. And it's uh, complementary aligned to other data services uh, and for instance, of course, Copernicus Marine Service, uh, which then has the satellite and remote sensing focus, while uh, EMOTNET is more than has an in situ focus. So we are developing data and data products, and that uh, is from the surface to the seafloor. So that's then the focus on the data collected in city. We have seven thematics and one central portal. There's a data ingestion and a secretariat where I'm uh, working at the EMOTNET Secretariat. So what's the added value uh, of EMOTNET to the two different um, talks we already heard? So first thing is that the data services and web services uh, to discover are open and have a free access. And also uh, they come from a trusted source. What we do then at EMOTNET, we uh, follow the inspired and fair data principles we uh, make the aggregated and harmonized multi-parameter data sets available. We have searchable metadata on top of that. The data services that we offer, um, there's integrated data products and we have availability of web services um, following the OGC, so machine uh, to machine readability, WMS, 
uh, WFS and others. So a little bit on the right hand where you see an overview. So there's the data, the metadata, data products and data services all uh, closely linked to each other. So the core principles of EmailNet is actually to collect data once and then use it or reuse it many times. Uh, we are developing also data standards across and within the disciplines. So we are really on the, the foreground there on, on developing those standards with the communities. So process and validate data at different EU levels. We uh, extract the maximum value for, from efforts of member states. We build on existing efforts from the data communities to develop a user-driven decision-making process. And just one important fact is also to recognize that marine data are a public good. So EMOSNet provides access to a range of data archives across seven disciplines. There's bathymetry, physics, chemistry, biology, geology, seabed habitats, and human activities. So from all these, you can look for information. You will find data sets and data to download the metadata. So that's really the four or the seven disciplines to start uh, exploring. Then there's a central portal that provides a single access point to the seven thematic portals. Uh, so here's the URL, emonet.ec.europa.eu. And under the data portals tab, you have the data portals overview, but also all uh, seven uh, thematic. So on the data access, um, there's first data products uh, accessible through the map viewer. So there's a central viewer for all EMOTNET products at uh, this URL. And a good news about this is that we are in fact centralizing all the different thematic portals that exist now which uh, allow you to have access to the central portal, but we are structurally integrating these into the central portal. So one of the things that we are now uh, really uh, spend a lot of time on is actually um, populating this geo viewer with all the thematic uh, portals data sets. So I think by the hackathon itself, you will be already able to use the new GeoViewer, the new map viewer that we are developing, which will have new functionalities, will be user friendlier than the previous one. And from here, you can just start browsing and start looking at layers. Uh, from there, you can look at the metadata, exactly what it is that uh, you are seeing, and then also go to download the data or go to a web service to use the data in your, um, in your challenge. Then there's also a metadata catalog. So there's a search and filter on the inspired metadata of all EMOTNET products. So there's a URL as well. So here you can really filter by all the thematics, uh, even the, the types of resources, the topics. You also have a free uh, search field where you can just type in whatever parameter you're looking for or whatever you think could be a keyword and uh, let's say the, the catalog will show if there is a data set of this. Then we also have Internet web services. So to access the Internet data products and metadata, we have OGC web services and other APIs and that web service documentation. And also examples of R code are on our GitHub which you see here, and also through the central portal website, you have access to this uh, under products and then web services, where you find all this information. So this allows you to have access straight to all the web services that are running and are uh, yeah, kept alive by all the thematic portals. So that's really in short what I wanted to say about the Um I will hear uh, further on uh, during the roundtable, maybe if there are any other questions. Super. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Francis. I think it was a very, very good overview of uh, everything that is, uh, that is made available for the participants and that they can use during the building of their projects. And, uh, and perhaps now we can invite the other two, uh, the other two speakers and, uh, and have a little bit of discussion, uh, the three of you, about uh, you know what type of uh, what type of data uh, you know would inspire participants to to build. So I'm inviting the other two uh, speakers 
back into the into the call and perhaps uh, one I think common theme that a lot of you were presenting is the accessibility of the data making sure that the participants can play around with it even for people who had never interacted with this uh, with these portals have never interacted with this data so one question that I wanted to ask you all and I think most of you mentioned it during your presentations but just to reinforce this how to get started you know where can they find information, uh, you know, some tutorials, some videos, some getting started guides uh, for each of the, the tools that were presented? And uh, Francis, maybe let's begin with you. Yes, so I think yeah, we can really start off straight with the need looking at uh, the map here to really discover the, the wealth of data that EMAT has on these different uh, teams. So that's one way to really visually uh, go look for data. Then another one is indeed the, the data catalog. That's another uh, important way of how to, to get data. But of course, if you want to go more into, um, let's say, having an overview, it would definitely be good to look at the videos that we've produced. So under the videos tab, uh, under communication, you will see a lot of videos that also showcase what actually uh, all the different thematics are often as parameters. This might be a bit... Um, yeah, hidden behind what the symmetry is uh, to know what parameters you will find there, yeah. or the people, chemistry, geology, etc. So that's, uh, that's definitely yeah. also yeah. we have a lot of video in that. And uh, Corinne, from uh, from the from the data that Copernicus is making available, what's what's the best way to start in terms of tutorials or uh, getting started guides? Yes, I think. Um, Users can find tutorials on, uh, on the YouTube channel of Copernicus Marine Service and also on the website there are e-learning materials uh, in this uh, service uh, page. And uh, I uh, invite uh, you to visit our web pages, especially User Corner and the service desk uh, of uh, Copernicus Marine Service uh, is already available uh, to answer your questions before the challenges. Yeah. Haley, what about uh, Eometsat? You had a long list of... Hi. Uh, getting started guys. Yeah. <laughs> we have lots and lots of different information, but I would recommend if you really want to get an idea quickly of hands on with Sentinel three. So if you go to our YouTube channel, there's three different videos, one for ocean color, one for SST and one for altimetry, which show you how to access the data via our uh, online access services using the graphical user interface and then show you when it's downloaded, how to open a file, how to look at it in a piece of freely available software. Um, and then tell you a little bit about the things you need to know about it uh, in terms of quality and flagging and things like that and making quick visualizations. So that's a really good way of getting started. After that, we've got some similar tutorials that are available through Wekio, which show you a bit more of a um, kind of comprehensive programmatic way of accessing the data and using Python, for example, then to you know, manipulate the data if you like. I would recommend those two resources primarily. Very cool, very cool. Then I think a, a question that might be in the back of the mind of some of the participants is that, you know, at this stage, they're probably thinking, you know, which problem is interesting for me to solve? Uh, what solution would I like to develop? Which data to use? And I see that a lot of the data sources that you have are complementary. So you could try to play around by, by using, uh, you know, different data sources uh, from different data sets and play around with it. So perhaps you can, I don't know, walk us through a little bit how this how the data can be combined uh, you know perhaps some inspiration on how to combine the data from the different uh, sources that we have here or how they can play together in terms of formats or in terms of uh, you know the scales being used I don't know Haley maybe maybe we can start with you this time yeah, I can definitely talk to that a bit. I think it's it's all about these scales. Um, you know, you have in situ data, which is highly accurate to that point, uh, which can give you a lot of in-depth information about exactly what's going in in this particular patch of water at a particular time. You can scale that up to the satellite scale with a single image to look more broadly in space. And then you can even go and look further in time if you use multiple satellite images together. And I think that really covers, you know, what ImodNet is able to offer what we're able to offer at UMETSAT and then what the Marine Service is able to offer. Um, and I think it's just about choosing that right scale for the problem. Um, so you have to think about, you know, 
how often does this particular thing I'm interested in happen or how long do I need to look at a time series in order to make an appropriately accurate decision about something? I think that's something that a lot of the mentors will be able to help with uh, during the hackathon. But yeah, think about the time and space scales of your challenge. Yeah, Francis, Corinne, anything to add there about the complementary of the data? No, I think maybe just to, to precise that, um, uh, for example, for modeling uh, computation, uh, we can also use uh, observation to validate results. Yeah. And Francis, yes, I don't well, know if you uh, want to add there, yeah. Yes, yeah, I think when the when the AD set, uh, I can only indeed also confirm that, but maybe it's so, um, yeah. We could look at mapping areas uh, of ecological importance, you know, in the open sea or in the coast, and then just uh, to see how you can indeed gather this information from uh, from different uh, teams, let's say from EOMets at our Copernicus uh, Marine Service and EMOTnet. Uh, that could be one way or another way just to look at uh, marine data, wind, sea conditions, and currents. That is actually uh, under internet physics, but at the same time coming from satellite data. So that's definitely something uh, to look at. Um, yeah, there's there's a multiple ways of, of looking at things. Uh, maybe looking at the coastal and marine environment, looking at species and habitat by the, uh, diversity, and then how they contribute uh, to to human humans as an essential resource, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. Yeah, I see lots of possibilities here. Yeah, as I've heard the two talks, uh, yeah, there's a multitude of, of things on how to interact with each other. And just to just to add to that uh, previous question, I mean, obviously, making use of the different data sets uh, could be interesting for some projects. Uh, w what about the data formats and how you how the different providers of data uh, name their variables? Are they using uh, a common uh, common understanding regarding the variables so that then it's easier for the the participants to understand? I don't know who wants to who wants to kick this one. Maybe, I, think yeah. I think generally speaking, yes, we try and use things like um, net CDF conventions for the naming of variables. So you'll see chlorophyll called chlorophyll in different places um, and things like that. So that should help. Um, those those sorts of uh, conventions are fairly common and we're all using, I think, pretty much all net CDF or similar format data. So we do have these conventions within the ocean community that can help you to go from one product to another. They can sometimes be over different um, spatial and temporal resolutions, though, so that's always worth um, looking at in detail. And there's various tools out there that can allow you to kind of convert um, and expand between these uh, different um, scales, tools like QDAL and Python, like yeah. that. Uh, there, there's one specific question from the audience regarding uh, data uh, around the, the Libyan uh, sea coast. Is that is that available? I, I'm assuming so, but perhaps perhaps one of you can expand a little bit on what is available. What is available uh, there? Francis, do you want to go ahead from Emotnet? Yes, I can. But what was the area exactly? Libya, Libya's Libya sea coast. Mm, yes. Well, um, for what uh, in the Mediterranean, I guess we have uh, really a lot of uh, data. There's, uh, yeah, there's definitely data out there. Yeah, so, I would assume. Um, I would assume for the Mediterranean, there's there's plenty of data sets from from all all yeah. the data providers. Yes, 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 definitely. Yeah. So yeah, no, no problem there. Yeah. yeah. Sure. And then someone also asked, uh, so regarding the potential for hydrogen uh, data, is there a, a specific product which offers the potential for hydrogen uh, in one of your data sets? I don't know, in the Copernicus perhaps or? Yes, uh, the, we have the potential hydrogen uh, in the model and in the observations too. And uh, these uh, parameters can be used uh, to, to monitor the acidification uh, of the ocean and uh, its uh, impact. Uh, the application are uh, on the ocean health and, uh, for example, the, can monitor the, the negative impact of acidification uh, on uh, calcifying uh, organism like uh, coral. Uh, with uh, coral bleaching, for example, or calcifying uh, plankton 
so the, the um, observed decreases in uh, ocean pH resulting uh, from uh, increasing of uh, the CO2. So it's uh, an important uh, indicator of uh, global change. And, and maybe one, uh, one last question to, to, to all of you, uh, a little bit sneaky, but uh, would, would you look at the data that is available as a way for participants to understand the problems that they're solving better, or also to use that data to build some of the solutions uh, that they're building? What would your approach be? Uh, Haley, maybe let's start with you. Yeah, I think it can be both. Um, I mean, the the data gives us like sort of unparalleled understanding of what's actually happening in the ocean. So you can observe the impacts of different problems or challenges, but you can also use it, I think, to facilitate decision making, whether that is, for example, deciding where you're going to take your ship on a particular day um, to go fishing or to take the most fuel efficient route or to decide, as I said before, with the aquaculture example, you know, whether that seafood is going to be safe to eat or maybe you should harvest it a couple of days early, a couple of days later. Um, you can actually use this data to make decisions that can save money, save lives and things like that. And I think that's really where the strength is. Yeah. Francis, anything to add there? No, really, you just uh, took all my lines, I think. <laughs> this is, yeah, it's really what I was looking at as well to say. It's uh, it's it's really both. Uh, yeah, couldn't have said it better. Um, yeah. So, yeah it's, I would maybe go a little more, little more to solution solving. That's always nice to have this kind of new things that you think of how to solve things. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. And Corinne? I think uh, uh, Francis and Hede uh, gave uh, a very good uh, comments, very good comments. Yes, uh, the both approach uh, are good. All right. So just as a, as a general reminder, of course, you know, we, we focus this event on data. Um, there's a lot of data resources and I really invite all the participants who are watching us uh, today or are watching this pre-event to check out the uh, resources uh, tab on the Garage 48 webpage for this event because we will list all the resources that were mentioned here. We will make sure that you know information regarding the tutorials and the videos that make sense to watch are also listed there so that you don't get lost in your first steps toward this. A reminder as well that all the projects that are going to be uh, accepted for the hackathon need to use some of the data that is being put available to the participants so that they really build their projects based on this data, whether to explore the problem or design good solutions using this data. And also, this is not the only event where we're going to talk about data. The next one is going to be on the 1st of March, where we're going to introduce the Wekio platform, how to use the data and the functionalities that the Wekio platform has to offer. That's going to happen on the 1st of March. And with that said, I have to thank all the participants of today's pre-event, all the speakers. Thank you so much for your time and effort in explaining what is available for the participants and hope to see you around at the events as mentors to guide the teams. Thank you so much.